The next uh, speaker is uh, Giat Valley on composition of space time. How do I make the full screen? I'm oh, sorry. Okay, great. Well, okay, thank you very much for uh, invitation to this uh, great conference. And before I start, I want to say a couple of words. Uh, I was a young postdoc here in Pisa, so I consider uh, Pisa like uh, my uh, alma mater with uh, Ricardo. It was an unbelievable experience. I learned uh, many things from Ricardo, most importantly the, the attitude and what physics is about, and uh, I really want to thank for, uh, for all this, uh, Ricardo, very much. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, for this conference. And. Um, Okay, so I will try to, is there a point? Yeah, this is a point. Uh, so I will try to uh, discuss some, some, some new ideas that we are very much excited about. This is about, um, one can uh, call this uh, set of the, this framework uh, uh, quantum composite, compositeness of, of gravity or of space time. This is mostly, uh, in collaboration with Cesar Gomez and uh, a bunch, bunch of students of, of mine, uh, uh, Nico Wintergast, Daniel Flessing, and Alex Pretzel in particular, and in, in this talk. And um, so the idea is to, uh, so the, 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 the big, big picture is that to understand uh, what we normally think as a classical field, uh, quantum mechanically, as a composite entity. Uh, now, and then once you make this uh, assumption, which to me is not even an assumption, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's the only option, uh, otherwise I cannot even imagine, uh, because in quantum physics everything is composite, of quanta. Um, then uh, what all, some interesting things uh, open up, uh, and uh, this is what I want to share with you. Um, now, as, as, as we know, in gravity, every source, every, uh, every gravitating object has a gravitational radius, associated gravitational radius, a Schwarzschild radius. The, the same is true about the universe, but the universe also has a second radius, which is so-called Hubble radius. Now, uh, for the uh, certain class of universes, these two radii are the same. So, from, for instance, in our universe, the Schwarzschild radius of our universe is extremely close to the Hubble radius. And in fact, as long as we can tell, it's equal. So, this means that there is a, some deep similarity between black holes and cosmological spaces. And therefore, what I will discuss, I will try to apply to both of these uh, uh, cases. Now, one thing which is very interesting, what emerges is the following. Now, normally we think, so the, the thing about what is classicality and what is quantumness. Now, normally we think that big things are classical. For example, a black hole, any black hole which is uh, heavier than the Planck mass, uh, must be, is, is in a good, good approximation, should be classical. Um, Planck mass is approximately 10 to the 5 grams, mass of amoeba. Uh, in particular, a black hole of the size of the universe, of the mass of the universe, uh, will have size 10 to the 28 centimeters. Now, everybody in the, uh, with, the, with the normal uh, quantum mechanical intuition... Uh, oh, sorry, minus 5. Sorry. <laughs> I made amoeba a bit uh, heavier, but okay. It, even 10 to the 5 is fine. Uh, on, the, on the scales of the universe, it does, doesn't make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, now the point is that uh, everybody would tell you that something so big should be classical in a very good approximation. But actually, what we are finding is that bigger things, bigger black holes, and bigger cosmological spaces are more quantum. Okay? And this is very surprising. In fact, black holes are ultra quantum. In a sense, they are the most quantum things that you can make. And I will explain in which sense, okay? And then, we believe that this is the key for understanding all these so-called black hole mysteries. The, the, the black hole mysteries appear because normally we think that the semi-classical uh, computations 
are, apl are applicable to real black holes. And I claim that they are not applicable. Uh, and uh, that's the reason. Now, as you know, this, all these black hole mysteries are absence of hair, that black holes do not have memory about where they come from. Uh, then there is exact thermality of Hawking radiation, uh, Bekenstein entropy, and everything. Now, among these things, the Bekenstein entropy will be the only one that survives in the quantum picture. Everything else gets corrected. Of course, Hawking radiation is still there, but it will not be thermal, will be corrected. So the question is how strongly it will be corrected. The absence of hair is gone, uh, and so on. Now, yeah, so this is like pictorially uh, a person, Alice, that is confused about black holes because she sees a thermal spectrum, and then she thinks that this must be a substance in, in thermal equilibrium, but okay, as we know, none of them work. You can get all possible crazy uh, paradoxes if you make this assumption that semi-classical approximation works because uh, you get uh, all folks' theorems about violation of global quantum numbers by black holes and this kind of stuff, which, is, which you think is, it is totally fantastic, right? That somehow a galactic-sized black hole should know whether your global quantum number should be violated or not, okay? Um, also information paradox and this kind of stuff. Now, these paradoxes are impossible to address in the semi-classical picture because they are a result of the semi-classical picture. So to address these paradoxes, you need a microscopic theory of a black hole. And I will try to provide such a theory. And then as we will see, for example, black holes can carry perfectly nicely, consistently, uh, for instance, baryonic hair, and could be even of astrophysical importance, and so on. Now, what is the key point? Uh, now, we introduce black holes as a Schwarzschild solution, for example, in GR. In fact, you don't need even GR. Uh, black holes were discovered even before, okay, even in Newtonian gravity. You can understand that there must be black holes. Um, now, the, we introduce them through the metric. A metric is a classical field. It's an intrinsically classical entity because it's, it's defined at every given point of the space-time. Now, on the other hand, if you are a quantum field theory person or even a quantum mechanical person, in quantum mechanics, there is a vacuum, which usually we define as a state with no particles, no occupation number, and then there are particles which are weakly coupled, and everything comes as certain state of those particles. In quantum field theory, there is nothing else, okay? Therefore, our key point would be that we should be able to understand curved backgrounds and black holes as states on Minkowski vacuum, but with certain occupation number of gravitons, okay? Everything you should be able to reformulate in this language, okay? This is the key point. Uh, Yeah, the off shell, I mean, that's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, that's, look, we cannot debate an assumption. Let's make this assumption and see how far we go. Okay, that's, uh, I mean, you, I understand that this is the, this remark that you are saying, it's a fair remark. This is what comes first in mind, of course. We are taught in textbooks that uh, uh, the sources define longitudinal uh, degrees of freedom. They are not real degrees of freedom, but things turns out that when you are dealing with space times with horizons, things change because these things are essentially behave like Bose-Einstein condensates of gravitons at the quantum critical point, and then things are very different, okay? But yeah, this is an absolutely fair remark. Um, now, so basically, what is the key point? The point, key point is that if you have a gravitational background with characteristic curvature radius R, then you should think of it as a state with certain occupation number of gravitational quanta, okay, with characteristic wavelength of given by this curvature radius, okay? This is the picture quantum mechanically. And then the, uh, the radius will be given by, for black holes will be the gravitation radius, for the Hubble will be, for the cosmology will be Hubble radius, and so on, okay? Now the point is that now, once you make this assumption, there, there is no room to wiggle. You can give this uh, assumption to a, uh, in fact, to a, to a, to a first-year student, and uh, anybody that knows about h bar omega can estimate how many quanta should be in this kind of configuration, okay, period. If you give the energy of the gravitational field and uh, the, the, this assumption, you can compute it. And the number of quanta comes out to be very interesting because it, it, it as if it depends on the surface, okay? You see that there is a dependence, R square or L Planck. L Planck is the Planck length. And so, uh, but I didn't input any holography or anything like that. This is just simply counting number of quanta, period, okay? Um, well, so th now, the wavelength is given by R, and then from there you discover the following thing. 
Now, what are the gravitons? The gravitons are uh, particles which uh, have spin zero and mass, uh, sorry, spin two and mass zero, and they interact through certain rules given by Einstein, expansion of the Einstein uh, uh, curvature t t tensor, uh, Einstein's Lagrangian. Um, so I can define a quantum coupling between gravitons. Uh, that's ob obvious. Uh, we can define it. And the interesting thing about quantum coupling of gravitons, as you know, is that it depends on the uh, de Broglie wavelength of the momentum transfer. So if you scatter two gravitons, the, the coupling depends on the wavelength. And this is the incredible property of gravity, that coupling changes from situation to situation. Now, once you realize this and com then compare with the previous story, you realize that what you thought as a curved background with certain curvature radius is Oh, by the way, you can, re sorry, you can rewrite also alpha in, in conveniently as a ratio of the Planck uh, length square because Planck length is uh, defined through h bar times g Newton. Uh, Planck length uh, square to the wavelength square, okay? As you see, alpha is an intrinsically quantum entity. When I take uh, h bar to zero, it goes to zero as it should, okay? L Planck also goes to zero in that limit. Now, once you compare this with this, you discover that uh, these gravitons with occupation number n, in fact, equal to one over alpha. Now, this is again re uh, very remarkable because the number scales as area, although you never talked about area. This scales as area because the gravitational coupling has this property that it scales as area, period, okay? That's the property of gravity that is quantum coupling scales as area in three plus one dimensions. In any dimensions, by the way, would be the exactly the same relation, okay? Now, this always smell, smells sort of holographic, right? You can imagine that there is something here that already related to the surface. Now, the point is, okay, now you can press on and say, oh, I have the situation, now I should recover everything that, that I know in certain limit, okay? So, for example, uh, you should recover, uh, as, so, how the card metric emerges in this description? In this description, there is no card metric. There is, a, there is a Minkowski vacuum and occupation number of gravitons. Now, if I have a probe, this probe moves in this background and scatters. It's an intrinsically quantum scattering. Then, what, how the, what notion of the card metric emerges? This is a order by order summation of all the scattering diagrams, okay, in this background. And you can make one to one correspondence. Actually, it's totally straightforward. You can see, for instance, this corresponds to the leading term. Uh, so, if you, you, everybody know, knows here that uh, I can do this is. Classical metric, G mu nu, I can expand classical metric in per perturbations, in classical perturbations, okay? So the first order, second order. Now, I can obtain this expansion as a limit of a quantum process, but what is the limit? Limit is that when I take n to infinity and fix gravitational radius constant, okay? Now, there is one more parameter that you have to decide what to do, h bar. Now. On top of that, if you fix h bar non-zero, then this limit gives you semi-classical situation. In other words, you, have a quant you can have a quantum probe, phi, moving on a classical background. If you also take h bar to zero, then it will be simply cl classical situation. So this is how the metric emerges in this description. Now, this is, so these diagrams, they survive in classical limit. Of course, they survive in semi-classical limit, and they survive in classical limit. There is another set of diagrams which only survives in semi-classical limit. What are these diagrams? These diagrams are the following, that you have certain occupation number of gravitons, and of course it's an interacting theory, and in an, in, in an interacting theory, as you know very well, you cannot keep system in the would-be ground state. It always will deplete. Why? Because particles interact, they scatter, and some of the particles will leave the condensate. Now, this is the diagram which reproduces for a black hole the, uh, the Hawking's evaporation in the semi-classical limit. This survives in the semi-classical limit, but vanishes in the classical limit. Uh, in case of inflationary cosmology, this reproduces uh, Starobinsky's gravitational waves or Gibbons Hawking, depending whether you are infl in inflation or, or pure de Sitter. And uh, so now, how inflation differs with, uh, from pure de Sitter is that in inflationary uh, space-time, you have occupation number of other quanta, inflatons. Now, if you have a uh, system also has occupation number of other quanta, let, let me call them n phi, this number, then this depletion is enhanced by n phi over n. 
Okay, so you deplete more particles. Why? Because there are more guys available that you can rescatter it. Okay, so this is this is it's usual enhancement of the uh, essentially the enhancement of the of the branching ratios. The, the question. Now, the, the, I claim that this number m phi over n is what is tends. You, you all remember that in inflation, right? The, the scalar perturbations are enhanced relative to gravitational waves. That's why they are enhanced. Okay. This is exactly enhancement of scalar perturbations because scalar perturbations come from the depletion of gravitons when they rescatter at the inflatons, and the tensor perturbations come when in graviton gravi from the graviton graviton scattering, and they don't have this enhancement factor. Okay, um, and so on. So now let me uh, try to apply this just to illustrate some points. So what is inter okay, interesting is not the part that we reproduced, uh, which is known. The interesting are new effects. Okay, now what are the new effects? Uh, now let me apply this idea to inflation, all right? So let me take, for instance, m square phi squared at uh, Linde's chaotic inflation. Now, in Linde's chaotic inflation, you know, right, that there is a potential and that there is a scalar field phi, and if the scalar field expectation value is much larger than the Planck, uh, Planck scale, then there is an inflationary regime, okay? So these are two equations, phi moving in the background gravitational field, and then the equation, in turn, phi sources gravitational field, right? These two equations. There is a, you can define two slow roll parameters, a standard, okay, which these are epsilon and eta in inflationary cosmology, and when these two parameters are small, then you have an inflationary regime, and the H is approximately constant. Now, the, the, the question is, what is going on quantum mechanically in this system? Why quantum mechanically I have inflation, even? So you can uh, no notice now the following, that now inflaton space-time is a mixture of two Bose fluids. One is graviton fluid, which is always there. Another one is inflaton fluid, which sources gra also sources graviton fluid. Now the occupation number of graviton fluid, you can estimate, you can, is, is, is what I said before. It's like simply uh, um, R, um, the, 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 the scale divided by Planck square. But the occupation number of inflaton fluid is enhanced by one over the slow roll parameter. This is very interesting because this tells you that if you try to make inflation slow roll, depletion blows up, okay? That's why you enhance scalar the scalar perturbations relative to gravity waves. They are controlled by one over epsilon. So, N phi, so essentially depletion is enhanced by n phi over n and goes to infinity when epsilon goes to, to zero. Now, this perfectly matches whatever we know in the inflation. If I take semi-classical limit from here, I will obtain whatever Mukhanov, Chipizov, Sarobinsky, these people obtain, okay? But the interesting thing is not to take semi-classical limit because we are not semi-classical. N is finite. You cannot keep N infinite because N depends on the curvature radius, N H bar, and uh, that's it, it's fixed. So, uh, so for instance, in, uh, the, in the standard inflationary scenario in which Hubble parameter is 10 to the uh, 12 or something like that, so uh, N is approximately 10 to the 12, okay? So what, like uh, 100 billion, uh, of gravitons are what make the, the inflationary density space. What is the of the gravitons? Well, the frequency, there are two types. Okay, I, I don't, I don't want to go in too much into this technicalities, but the, the, they are, you should remember, they are off-shell. So, uh, off-shell standard, to, so the, the, they are ones which have frequency but no momenta. So, for instance, you can have guys with frequency, the Hubble, I mean, this frequency is Hubble. Uh, frequency, but they, don't, they are not required to have also momenta. You can have guys with pure momenta, no frequency, because they are of shell compared to, they are not, they are not free, they are not, they do not satisfy any free wave equation. Now, the point is that, th so these two equations are very interesting, because these two equations are what the, the, determine, uh, uh, what determine the uh, evolution of N, okay, in time. So now the point is very simple, right? Uh, so either you tell me that you don't believe that gravitational field has constituents, okay? Then I cannot argue with you. Although I will think that that's, that's, that's wrong, but I cannot argue. How about electric? But, but what? How about electric? Electric field is a little bit, it's, it's a story is a little bit similar, but there, there, are, there are fundamental differences because of quantum criticality. But I'll, I'll um, so I'm not discussing electric field in this talk, but it's true, it's the same thing, you can think, the point is the following. Of course, I'm not saying that you can always think about an electric field being composite of longitudinal gravitons. But static electric field does not have 
come on, I mean, there are papers in which people derive as, as longitudinal gravitons, but the point is not that. The point is how useful is that, okay? This is, the, uh, the, the, this is a textbook case. You can rewrite this through BRST quantization. You can think of it as a vacuum with, when you annihilate the source. or it, you can, This is not the point. The point is, how useful is this? The, what I claim is that for the space times when, which have classically horizon, this is extremely not just useful, this is necessary. For electric field, you don't gain much if you, if you, if you recast the electric field as occupation number of certain longi longitudinal photons. You are absolutely right. Let me continue. Okay. <laughs> Let me continue. No, we, what you are saying is correct, but I, I mean, that's, I don't know what. Uh, uh, all I'm saying is the following: that there are cases in which this representation is extremely important. I am telling, I'm demonstrating these cases. Okay. Now we can only debate here an assumption. The assumption I cannot debate because it's, it's very hard to debate assumptions. I mean, the postulate is extremely hard to debate. But if you think that the gravitational field should not be thought as being composite and is a fundamental elementary entity, then there is no problem. I mean, then, we, then there is nothing to discuss. So let me stay with this picture, OK? Now, the point is the following. Then these are two master equations uh, which, which control the, uh, the, 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 the change of the reservoir. So in other words, once you accept constituents of the gravitational field, then you can think about the metric, OK, as a so finite reservoir of occupation numbers. And the, the particle creation is not a vacuum process. This is the fundamental difference, right? So in the standard picture, particle creation is a vacuum process. In the Hawking picture, for instance, or in standard inflationary perturbations, why? Because you have a background which is not changing, and you are creating particles on this background. Of course, we only recover that in infinite n limit, because in infinite n, the background becomes, so capacity of the background becomes infinite, and there is no back reaction. But for finite n, the, because in our case, the depletion is a physical process in which you have occupation number, and they are depleted. So n changes. The point is this, OK? We cannot sit on two chairs. So if the, if, the, uh, if the gravitational field has constituency, we have to face the fact that there is a depletion, OK? Now, then you have, the, you have two competing processes. You see, you have two clocks. One is the first term in this equation is normal classical equation, OK? In other words, how you would evaluate n only by classical change. And the second term is the depletion term, which is quantum. So there are two clocks. One clock is trying to refill the reservoir. This is classical clock. Why? Because this clock is trying to make Hubble, uh, Hubble radius bigger and bigger. But there is a second clock which is trying to deplete it. Now, obviously, you will get an inconsistency if the quantum clock wins. Therefore, this is telling you that the, the inflationary space time in this picture cannot have infinite number of foldings. OK? The number of foldings is limited. Now, this part, part the fact that number of foldings could be limited, we, this was noticed by other people in different contexts, OK? Here, what is important for us is the context, OK? In particular, uh, in other words, what we are saying is that there is a finite number, and you are depleting it. And that's the, that's the, that's the reason, OK? Yeah. <laughs> no, we get stronger bound. That's the point. Because, for instance, there was a paper by Kraminelli et al., right? Uh, and, huh? Oh, you're not in the paper. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, you see how famous you are? That we, we think that you are on, the, on all the papers, but <laughs> OK. No, our bound is stronger, the, the, let me tell you. Yeah, because you see, those arguments that people were making, that the, 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 the number of holdings cannot be, th those were based on semi-classical intuition. You see, everybody had a correct intuition that something is wrong with the sitter space, including Polyakov, the Woodard, Samis. They, they were seeing that there is something going on with eternity in the, in the, the sitter space. The problem is that in the semi-classical picture, you cannot answer this question. You can only say, oh, maybe their analysis is, uh, no, I should not take it seriously, because all they see is the perturbation theory breaks down. By the way, this is what I thought. Okay? I thought that their analysis, okay, only it shows that some perturbation theory breaks down. But in this language, there is no way out. We, we get bound, but yeah, yeah, we get bound, uh, but much stronger because of this, uh, this, this thing. Because the point is very simple. It's like, you have a decider space, and this decider space depletes quanta, and finally it runs, runs out of half of the quanta. Of course, at that point, you can no longer talk about anything that has a semi-classical interpretation. Okay? At that point, you should stop. So in other words, any inflation which is classically not providing enough evolvings to make it to the end, okay, before you deplete quantum mechanically, 
okay, is, is doomed. You, is, it, now, you obtain a new state, okay, so, and this gives the bound, epsilon. So, in other words, slower parameter cannot be exceed this, uh, this, or, uh, this n, uh, n in power two thirds, one over n in power two thirds, or in the language of number of e foldings, this translates as uh, n in power two thirds, okay? Now, uh, so after this time, what happens is that your Hubble patch becomes intrinsically quantum. You can no longer, at least I don't know how to talk about it in any sensible classical metric terms. Now the question is, is this is an inconsistency? We don't know. So what we can say for sure is that in this picture, or in any picture in which you buy that the gravitational field has constituents, you will, you will hit this bound. What happens after that, I don't know. Maybe the, the Hubble patch could continue eternally in this uh, intrinsically quantum state, which is half depleted, uh, and uh, you cannot describe in terms of the metric. By the way, there is a very orthogonal indication which indicates exactly the same thing through the generation of the entanglement, okay? So now, before I go there and uh, then finish my talk, so um, there are observable corrections. This picture also, of course, predicts corrections to the, observ to the cosmological observables. Why? Because standard, in the standard picture, you don't take into account, you always compute your tilt, for instance, by evaluating n through the classical value. Now, what we claim is that there is a different difference between n evaluated from the classical value and the true n. That is a cumulative effect. And so this is the effect, okay? So for instance, for m squared pi squared, there will be correction to the tilt. Well, square root of n is the how far you are, the usual story, how far you are from the end of inflation. Now, most interesting to me, correction is the second one. This is the correction to the scalar tensor ratio. Now, why this, uh, this, this, uh, this is very interesting? Because this is a correction which is sensitive to the entire age of inflation. Look, normally we say that there is cosmic no here theorem and so, so on, right? Because of, it's just like for black holes, inflation washes out all the memory about the past and we cannot measure age of inflation. We don't know, we can only see 60 foldings in our cosmological observations, we don't know what was before. Now, in this picture, this is impossible <laughs> because if the gravitation constituents has finite constituents and there is a quantum clock, quantum clock is counting. So you are scanning entire age of the inflation, even within the, the, the seeing observables within this, the given Hubble patch, okay? And so this is why this is very interesting because this is sensitive to the cumulative effect throughout the history, okay? Now, okay, this is uh, right, because delta n here is the, 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 the delta n is the number of evolvings from the beginning of inflation, okay? Now, this is, of course, very interesting, and this, this type of things were never explored. In fact, you see that here, this correction, you can confuse. For instance, you measure R, and you can, you can confuse this with some difference in the model of inflation because of the scales. But actually, this is, could come from here, okay? Um, so, basically, to summarize, this is the point. Uh, to summarize this, this, this part, this is the point that they are... Um, oh, great. Oh, I thought I was finishing. Okay, very good. Um, uh, so, there are two clocks, one is counting time, and they count time, they, they, and they, they have the opposite tendencies. Okay, whenever these two clocks, uh, um, whenever these two clocks con uh, contradict to each other, you, you have a situation when a classical description goes out. Now, it would be interesting to, to ask what is the implication of, the, of these facts for the cosmological constant problem, okay? So, the answer is I don't know. Because what we can say for sure, for sure, whatever implication is, there is an implication. Because what we are discovering is that the sitter cannot continue forever in a state which is describable by metric. Now, then entire story hangs whether this state, whatever state you arrive to, is itself consistent. Because if this quantum state is itself consistent and can continue forever, then you are not really solving any cosmological constant problem because you can just reformulate the question, which is very interesting on its own, of course, but you, are not really say, you cannot really say, oh, because of this, I can, I can avoid the sitter. But if that state is inconsistent, then this, is an, this would be a step forward because then you can say that the sitter simply, uh, eternal the sitter cannot be there, and okay, well, at least we are killing half of the problem. Okay, this does not apply to anti the sitter because in anti the sitter there is no depletion. Okay, um, okay, so now let me in, in, in remaining uh, um, time, time and seven minutes or whatever, let me let me go to black holes and uh, and uh, specify one one aspect of the of the black hole which we are very excited about again. 
Okay, now for black hole is the same story except for black hole situation is easier because black holes, for black holes, uh, spaces are symptotically Minkowski and you can form them in your thought experiment, okay? Uh, not at LHC so far, but okay, in the thought experiment you can do it. Um, so then I can, I, can, I can ask you to form a black hole in, in very simple terms. You can put on top of each other this number of gravitons. And then you can see, that indeed, when you put this number of gravitons, okay, uh, the, 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 the graviton uh, condensate becomes self-sustained. So this is a very nice, you can rewrite in a very nice form, and alpha gravity is one over n. When alpha gravity is one over n, the condensate becomes self-sustained, and classically, this is what you would say is a black hole. Now, now what is the point? Why, is, why black holes are so special? I said that they are quantum, because you can say, oh, precisely, like it goes to, to, to Slava's question, because why can't I think in the same way about this table? Okay, this table has constituents, but so what? I mean, this classical description is perfectly fine, uh, and so on. Uh, so, then, uh, this is an extremely important point, okay? And uh, the point is following. Now, macroscopic objects, all of them, they share the property that they have many constituents, okay? This is true about this table, Earth, galaxy, black holes, whatever. However, in most of the, the macroscopic bodies, like bucket of water, there is no universal alpha, because different constituents, they, they, they talk in different ways, okay? For instance, there is a nearest neighbor uh, uh, rule and so on. There is, so th that's why they are, most of them are classical. Then there is another, another set of uh, states, it's not states, but the substances, which are Bose-Einstein condensate. Now, they are one step forward, because they have many constituents, and everybody talks to each other at the same rate, okay? Finally, it turns out, but most of the Bose-Einstein condensates, they are perfectly classical. There is no problem. I mean, you can, you can apply mean field approximation and uh, perfectly nice. But then it turns out that there is a subset of Bose-Einstein condensate which have properties of gravity. Attraction, okay, in particular. And this, for this condensate, something extremely special happens when n times alpha is equal to one. Now, what happens? This is what happens, okay? Now, you see, if I take, for instance, gravitational field of the Earth. Gravitational field of the Earth is classical. I can think of it as being composed of, ma or comp composed of many gravitons. But it's still classical. Why? Because the energy levels, Bogolubov levels, are very highly spaced. In fact, if you do this exercise, try to compute the time scale it takes for the Earth's gravitational field to deplete a single graviton to a next level, it's 10 to the 12, 20, 26 years like much longer than the life of the universe. That's why Earth's gravitational field is classical, because these quantum effects are totally unimportant. Now, however, black holes are precisely at point one. Now, what it turns out that what happens at that point one is that n Bogolubov levels become exactly degenerate. Well, degenerate up to one over n. So, which means that, uh, and this is, by the way, whether you believe in black holes or not, whatever, this on its own, an extremely interesting phenomenon of nature, that you can have a system with enormous degeneracy of Bogolubov modes, okay? Now, for example, if I take these numbers for the, uh, the black hole of the Earth, Earth's mass, the degeneracy, the, the number of Bogolubov modes is 10 to the 66, degeneracy is exponent 10 to the 66, okay? This is, by the way, the source of Bekenstein entropy in this picture. And this is very interesting. I don't know, this is uh, wrong, uh, wrong, wrong uh, transparency. And finally, uh, do I have two minutes or it's, oh, how long do I have? Oh, five. Uh, yeah, I'm, I should not hurry because then it's... Okay, very good. So this is the point, okay? So the quantum criticality is what makes black holes quantum, okay? And that's why they are very different from any other objects. Exactly the same is true for cosmological spaces, like the sitter, anti the sitter. In fact, we think that this quantum criticality of anti the sitter, as being thought as graviton uh, occupation number, is the key for the holography, because if you, if you, uh, if you estimate the uh, coupling of these Bogolubov degrees of freedom, comes out to be exactly the central charge of CFT for, for, ADS, uh, for, for, for ADS story. Okay, it could be a coincidence. You can say this, this CFT has nothing to do with that CFT. Could be the story, although it would be very strange that you have two CFTs now in the, in the same, same, same story. So, but anyway, let me, in uh, this remaining time, uh, uh, discuss uh, another effect. So, uh, what happens once you have a black hole? 
there are two directions in which black hole evolves. So it uh, emits gravitons, depletes gravitons, is it because it's like a bucket of water. I already discussed this diagram, so I will not go back. Then there is another effect that develops entanglement extremely efficiently. Now, I want to skip this thing because I don't have time and go directly to the generation of entanglement. Now, look, this, uh, okay, this is the, the computer simulations done, done by these people, okay? But now, look at this beautiful uh, story, right? Precisely how, this is, the, the, this is plot which indicates for exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian of the, with this property, how the mode degeneracy appears there. And more, more incredible is this diagram. Look what is happening. This is evaluation of one particle entanglement entropy, okay? Now, already for the system with 10, n equals 10, the transition is extremely sharp. And for system with 10, 2000, this is like a vertical line. Okay, you see what is happening. System is becoming exceedingly quantum with more constituents. Why? Because you are at the critical point, okay? And now, the point is, that to finish with this, is that there was a conjecture by Haydn and Preskill, and then um, uh, Sakino and Saska, and they also gave some arguments, that black holes should be a very efficient scramblers of information, okay? Now, scrambling of information very crudely, you can think in the following way. Suppose somebody, think of this room as a system, and then somebody enters the room and gives the message, let's say, to me. And then I tell to, to, to Gabriele, and, and we, we spread the message. And how long it takes to store this message in everybody's brains, okay? And most of the systems in physics, are in, in, in nature, are diffusive, and it takes very long time. Typically, it takes like a, a, a number of constituents in some power. Now, there were these arguments by Haydn and Preskill that the in black holes should scramble information in logarithmic time, um, depending on the radius. Now, the problem is that since they, they were working in semi-classical picture, first, in semi-classical picture, you have to be extremely careful to even define the, the, the scrambling because it's a, it's a quantum notion. But anyway, they had this conjecture. But it was, it was impossible to, to, to check this because you need microscopic theory. So we checked it in this theory. Okay, now, in this theory, why you have chance to, 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 for this to work? Because it's supposed to Einstein condensate first, so everybody talks to each other immediately. But secondly, it's at the critical point. So we have enormous degeneracy. So what we did, we, first we gave a very rigorous definition of scrambling in this system, what it means, okay? So what it means, it's, it's related with quantum break time and generation of entanglement. And then, okay, then let me just show the picture and finish with this, okay? I don't know why they're small, but okay, the, look at this beautiful log, okay? Now, the, 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 scrambling, the scrambling time in this picture for this Bose-Einstein condensate at the critical point comes exactly to be log, okay? So first, these people were correct to, to conjecture that this is a log. And secondly, now we think we understand who are the fastest scramblers of nature. The fastest scramblers of nature are Bose-Einstein condensates at the critical point, okay? Why? Because they talk to each other very, 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 very efficiently, and also they are unstable. And they have enormous degeneracy of states. Now, of course, if you have this, these conditions, you generate entanglement extremely efficiently because you see it's like a quantum roulette, no? Right? Think of, about the hilltop. If I put a ball on the hilltop, classically it will just go to one location, okay? So classically I have super selection rule. It will not evolve to the superposition. But quantum mechanically, it will evolve into superposition. So immediately you generate entanglement. Zero. Okay, very good. I right, let me finish here. Period. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. system somehow develops some effective non-locality. Somehow the Bose-Einstein condensate is a it's condensate a, in momentum space, but somehow they talk to each other in principle. Yes, very far that apart. is true. So in other words, okay, I will not, so usually I'm very afraid of word non-locality in quantum field theory, but. Here it's the, the point yes, is next to near right. neighbors. So right, right. What happens is that it's, it's more like, I would, yeah, you are right. In a sense, you can call this non-locality, but um, it's a, because it's a collective effect. In other words, the point is the following, that the Bogolubo mods, they are not mods, they are not made out of any single graviton. They are a co very, 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 very interesting collective mode. But by the way, those are not uh, quasi-normal modes, you see? Quasi-normal modes are not Bogolubo modes. Bogolubo modes, in the semi-classical limit, you cannot see them. Why? Because they decouple as one over n. In semi-classical limit, you take n to infinity, 
Bogoluba mods, you're too excited. A single Bogoluba mod, it takes infinite time. By the way, this also explains why in the Hawking's case, radiation is purely thermal. It's, it's very simple because you cannot excite anyone, okay? It takes infinite time to, to retrieve any information because you cannot excite anyone there. And of course, you throw something in the black hole, it stays there eternally. But as soon as n is finite, of course, you, give, you get back information within time of order n, okay? So now there is some subtlety there, which is extremely interesting. Now, what is precisely log time? What is, the, what is happening between log time and the, and, the, and the time n, okay, in between? So system is trying to develop extremely efficient entanglement and, uh, okay, but, but you are right, yes. You can think in, okay, you can say that this is a non-local effect in a, in a good sense, I mean, in the, in the right. It's a, it's a, it's a non-local outcome, but automatic outcome, right. Oh, I have a really stupid question. I haven't understood. Do your black holes emit photons? Every, everybody, of course. But, but, the, but the picture, the, yeah, exactly. But the, in the picture, Ooh, yeah. In the in your in your diagrammatic picture, I, you need to knock out the graviton from the condensate. So yeah. I have two questions. One, a theory of electron-positron production in supercritical field is in a reasonable agreement with observations. Is your approach pr produce anything different? Yes. So you say that there is no difference? No, there will be difference one over n. Okay? I see. Okay. And se second question, uh, how much number of let's say your gravitons, which are virtual, depends upon gauge. Is it gauge dependent or no? Of course, not? everything is, I mean, it's, uh -huh. it's, 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 we are, we are super concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see. It's true, because look, what we are saying is that we are not changing Einstein gravity by a bit. We are saying that we are taking for granted as a fact of nature that gravitons exist, and they interact with this world. And so any, uh, an effective energy momentum tensor is, of course, conserved. <laughs> so no, no, no linkage. How to choose appropriate gauge and do things in, in that gauge. So, so you're using a, what superficially looks like a very naive, linearized description of Fox space and so on. Why are we supposed to believe this in a highly nonlinear situation, which is the black hole? No, you don't. First of all, you don't have to believe. We are not in the church, of course, but uh, you don't have to believe in anything. Uh, but that's precisely the point, right? The power of physics is that we don't have to believe. We can check. Now, what I'm telling is the following thing. What I'm saying is that nonlinear corrections are here, what I showed. But unfortunately, quantum gravity operates so far by mathematical consistency. So yeah, this is consistent. So you can check means, it. Okay, why is this mathematically consistent? I don't understand what you're asking. kind of thing in a nonlinear situation. No, why you should expect is a very good question, and I think that we should expect this, as this, this picture shows, because it seems that nature is extremely wise. So, but you are, but you are drawing the lower, the lower gravitons as if they are not interacting with each other, but that's not true. I mean, the, the lower three lines, they are parallel to each other, right? That, that's not uh, the right description if those guys interact with each other. I don't understand what you're asking. I'm telling you the I mean, you have this diagram, right? <laughs> of there course, are, there you are have three all the gravitons which don't yeah. talk to each other and the other guy is talking to... Uh, that's. I, I don't understand what you're asking. I just, space. You, you want me to draw all the, the infinite series of all the diagrams? I, I think the linearized Fox space is just not available not to you. Not linearized. This, you are absolutely well, wrong. I'm sorry. This is the, look, it's, uh, well, the, it is. You said and gravitons. And gravitons means it's, you, are, you are talking about Fox space, which is a linearized object. Why 
Einstein's equation, okay, which is getting removed. I can understand the set of diagrams, okay? This would one one ground on exchange, the other would be this. By the way, this is never going to be on the session, okay? And so, that gives you a series of nonlinear interactions. This fully recovers your nonlinear interactions. Here, I'm not discovering anything new. What I'm saying is the following thing. That's I think you go a step ahead of this, right? I think, I think you are going beyond this, beyond this old story, right? No, but when you say condensate, you're already cheating. There is no condensate. Condensate, the, the meaning of condensate, as it's used in condensed metaphysics, assumes weakly coupled, weakly interacting particles. Then they condense. That's the bose einstein condensate as it's in textbooks. You're using a lot of condensed matter terminology here, but I'm not sure it's really applicable. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in the limit, no, I'm sorry, in the limit of zero frequency, this argument is wrong, because this strong, this weak interaction gets multiplied by the time those gravitons have to interact, and that's why nonlinear, a nonlinear background forms. Yeah, we have to go offline. No, I don't know, if you want simply to, to, to fix it, you said something, you said something, but let's try to understand physics, okay? Uh, one thing that I don't understand is that w w your argument about quantum criticality seemed the dimensional argument that would have worked for any, even for a scalar theory with uh, uh, two derivative interactions, so phi phi, the phi, the phi, like in, in uh, Pion Lagrangian. I mean, even there you would have exactly the same dimensional analysis and you'll find criticality exactly at the same end. So w what is typical of spin two here? Yeah, but let's take a scalar. Let's not make. Let's make do we have? Um, I don't expect a black hole made of uh, pions, right? I mean, I said that's something else, but not a black hole. Thank you. 
Now, what is different about black hole? Because black hole exists for any rotation matter. What happens is the black hole loses the graviton and goes to a different black hole. But it's extremely hard to go with the electron at the critical point because gravitation coupling in black hole, in gravitation coupling in gravity is not fixed, it depends on the wavelengths. Okay? So this is the key why black holes are very different from solid ones. Because what I just said depends exactly the same way think about solid ones. For instance, monopole, I can think about monopole, and if I estimate the equation about monopole, it will be exactly this. But the point is that you move away by delta n, in fact you can compute it. Delta n is the square root of n. So you, what, what happens is that you see, you have particles in the ground state, okay, move the ground state, and then you decrease square root of n portion to the highest state here. Yeah. And then this back reacts and moves to the electron critical point. This cannot happen in the black hole physics because black hole, you see, the point is that in each system, uh, critical point is the point of maximum degeneracy. So, unless you give system an extra obstruction, not to take it, it's not to take it because maximum degeneracy is not one of the maximum degeneracy. So, you see, the black hole, you see, the black hole has a way to always take the critical point, no news like that. That's exactly the, the, the point of black hole physics. So you are absolutely right. There is no, no problem with ions. You can think of them as one the same. It's exactly the same thing. But if they are not physical. If this experiment will be done in the lab, when you back react and and uh, and uh, No, but that's what I'm saying. I don't see eternal inflation in this case, period. Yeah. Because, well, well, because the, however, eternal inflation, I, here I have to be extremely, because this is an extremely subtle coin, point. Because all I can show in this language is that after finite number of e-foldings, your inflationary patch evolves to the state which is no longer describable in a conventional classical metric. Now, this, of course, I'm not proving that you don't have any other consistent description for that state. But whatever the description is, this will not be a conventional eternal inflation, okay? Of course, then, is the, 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 yeah, that, that's the statement I can make. Now, what, it's an extremely interesting question, what is that state? So that state will be highly entangled, maximally entangled, because of this, this, these features, okay? And um, yeah, it will continue like uh, being in a maximally entangled state. My, no, so the point is the maximally entangled state you cannot understand as a classical mean field. Okay, because classical mean field is always something that you can approximate with one particle wave, wave function. And maximal entangled state, I don't know how to do it. And uh, okay, yeah, that's a very interesting question. We don't know the answer. Right. But that would be key to the cosmological constant, at least understanding something. Okay. No, it's impossible because you cannot. Because no, of course. In fact, the point is that. Um, Ricardo, you are asking exactly right questions. I, I suspect that you read some of the papers. No. Okay. No. no. Okay, very good. No, I'm honest. No, no, I know, I know. I, know. <laughs> I don't even read my I know, I know. The, the thing is that, no, what Ricardo is asking is, uh, actually, this is the way you can reformulate the quantum, uh, quantum mechanically, what you call an extremal black hole. So in this, our language, extremal black hole would be the one which has equal occupation number of photons and gravitons. And once you exceed that number, you, you are no longer in the black hole. Uh, story, okay? In fact, this language trivially explains why people never observed, so you see, there was this puzzle in black hole physics. Uh, for instance, you can have black holes with magnetic charge, but the magnetic charge exceeds the mass, then the black holes do not exist, they become singular. Here you see it trivially, because if magnetic charge exceeds the mass, then the occupation number of photons ex exits, uh, exceeds the occupation number of gravitons, and it can no longer be a black hole in this description, okay? So, yeah, so, but that's, yeah, that's the right question, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you.